I am Daniel Lickies and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years and today I have my special guest. He's the author of several books, no other than Mr. Paul Clark. Hello, Daniel. How are you today? I'm fabulous, fabulous like you, Mr. Paul. And again, can you please introduce yourself? Okay, so my name is Paul Clark. I'm British. Uh, I originally come from the city of Manchester, or I grew up there, but I live in the south of England now. Um, I used to be an English language teacher and became a, eventually became the owner of a language school. But for the last few years, I've just been doing writing. I've written four novels. Three of them are a trilogy, so we're going to be talking about one of them today. Uh, and my most recent book is a story of a young man who caused a traffic accident in which someone was killed. Um, my trilogy is three novels set in the former Soviet Union. So the first book is set in the communist era. It's called The Price of Dreams. Uh, and it's about a young man who's very ambitious but he also, he hates the communists. And there's a conflict between his ambition um, and his hatred of the, the ruling Communist Party in the Soviet Union. Then the second book takes him into the period when the Soviet Union has collapsed and his little part of the Soviet Union is falling apart because of conflict between different ethnic groups. And today we're gonna to be talking about the third book in the trilogy, Day of the Long Knives, which is about how he tries to overthrow the government of the little ex-Soviet Republic that he lives in. The government is a kind of combination of extreme right-wing nationalists and mafia. And he tries to overthrow them and help a democ democratic government to, to win. Interesting, Mr. Paul. So what is the initial step in writing Day of the Long Knives? Okay, so the the book, the three books of the trilogy started off as one book, um, which took him all the way from being a young man against the communists to uh, his period living after the communists. Um, but my agent told me it was too long and I needed to cut it up. So I eventually cut it up into three things. I think the book was inspired by events in the former Yugoslavia more than anything else, where you went from communist rule to a period of dislocation when the country literally fell apart and you got several independent countries being formed. Um, and then in Serbia, you had a, a very nasty government led by Slobodan Milosevic, which was kind of a little bit democratic, uh, quite a lot fascist um, and quite a lot mafia as well, which was eventually overthrown, leading to democracy, a very fragile democracy in Serbia. So I was I invented a Soviet republic where similar events could occur. So that that's the how the three books came to be written. Very well said, Mr. Paul. So how important is outlining all those trilogy? Uh, outlining was crucial. It was key for me. There's a lot of work that I did that doesn't appear in the books at all. So my little Soviet Republic that I in, in, invented, um, I started off with a map of the Republic. And then I wrote a history of the Republic that went back from the ancient Greeks, um, all the way from the ancient Greeks through the period of Turkish rule and Tatar rule um, to Russian rule, the Soviet Republic and to the modern day. And so none of this really appears in the book, but it was part of my planning for the book. And then I spent a long time planning what would happen. And it was pretty meticulous. I had spreadsheets saying what happened when. I spent a lot of time looking at my chapter structure. You know, each chapter has to end up 
uh, on a, ah, what's going to happen on the cliff edge? So I spend a long time planning my cliff edges for the different chapters. And I did a lot of research as well. There's a lot of events in Day of the Long Knives that actually happened. Um, but I've taken what actually happened and changed it and made it different for the purposes of my, my narrative. Interesting, Mr. Paul. So what techniques did you do in developing compelling and believable characters in the Day of the Long Knives? I think a key thing about characters is that your good guys are not completely good. Yeah, your good guys, and my hero, who's the hero of the trilogy, he is a good guy. He's a very good guy, but he's not beyond a little bit of skullduggery. Uh, he can be vain. He can be neglectful of the people he loves. And you get a bit of conflict between him and his wife in Day of the Long Knives, that she is trying to put the family first and the safety of their child first. And my hero, by getting involved in politics in a very dangerous country, is compromising her safety and the safety of their child. So you've got to make it believable. The other thing that I did in Day of the Long Knives in the first two books, you've got one antagonist who goes all the way through until Day of the Long Knives. In Day of the Long Knives, a second antagonist comes along who's, I think, a very interesting character. He, he has his own moral viewpoint. And there are certain things he will do and certain things he won't do. He believes he's a patriot. He believes that he's serving his country and he doesn't care how many people he kills in order to do what he thinks is necessary to serve his country. Um, he puts members of his family in the firing line as well. He has moral attitudes concerning women, but in the case of the hero's wife, he puts those to one side as well. So I try to make my, my characters believable. Um, the villains are not completely bad, with one exception. I do have a psychopath in there. And the heroes are not completely good. That they all believe in their own way that they're doing the right thing. Um, but some of them are doing the right thing and some of them are definitely doing the wrong thing. Definitely interesting, Mr. Paul. But before we go on, I want to shout out my listeners in Singapore. Thank you, Singapore, for supporting this podcast because in Central Singapore Community Development Council, I got 80% audience share. Singapore at 19 and Tom Pines New Town at 1%. Again, thank you, Singapore, for supporting this podcast because this podcast is created to empower writers, authors all over the world like Mr. Paul Clark. So yeah, Mr. hello to Singapore. I, I went to Singapore last year. And mm, yes. I stayed uh, at Gardens by the Bay for the evening. Wonderful. Love Wonderful it. Absolutely country. Love it. Wonderful country and one of the most expensive cities in the world right now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Paul, how does one choose the right setting for the story of your trilogy? Okay, so my, my trilogy was inspired by events in Yugoslavia. And when I first started writing it, I thought I would set it actually in Yugoslavia. Um, but then I realized it was very difficult to give it a happy ending because events in Bosnia in particular were pretty horrendous. So I invented my own country, uh, which was a Soviet Republic, an ethnic minority Soviet Republic in the North Caucasian region. Um, and I sent... When I finished the second book, A Long Night of Chaos, I sent a copy of it to a guy called Neil Acheson, who is a top British journalist who covered that area in the 1990s. And he wrote back to me, he said, what's your background? How did you get such a good feel for that part of the world? So I thought, mm, wow, I did my research pretty well. If I can get someone like that thinking I've done a good job of researching the area. Um, 
when you invent your own country, it's great. You you can use a lot of freedom. Uh, you can take a little bit of this country and a little bit of that country and mix it up together. Um, and it's good fun. I recommend that to anyone inventing their own country. I enjoyed it. Yes, highly recommended people. So what are the ways, uh, effective ways to build a plot that keeps readers engaged from beginning to end for your trilogy? The, I think the first thing that a reader has to do is care about the characters. Yeah, if you don't care about the people in the book, you're not going to read the book. So I have a central character who is very likable. We know he's not perfect, but he is very likable. Um, and you care about him and you care about his family and you want to make sure that they're okay. And I try to also have an antagonist in Day of the Long Knives who the reader can care about as well. Um, the reader, I hope, wants him to fail. But the greatest antagonist in literature, I think, is Long John Silver in Treasure Island. He's a fantastic character. He is the bad guy. He's the leader of the bad guys, and you love him because he's such an interesting character. And I I wouldn't say I'm as good as uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, but I tried to make my chief antagonist in Day of the Long Knives a character who the reader will feel curious about, who the reader will, you know, they want to see him fail, but there's something about him that they like. Uh, and that's something I was very keen to try and do. Certainly. So how did you ensure that the, your trilogy's theme is clearly communicated and impactful? Okay, I think it's a book which is set in a political situation. And I think the, the political situation, it's pretty clear what's going on. Uh, in different parts of it. Um, some readers have said, I think one reviewer of the second book said, this is like reading about real life. Uh, there's a lot of skullduggery going on between the different political groups. There's a lot of backstabbing between them. And the same in the third volume of the trilogy. There's a lot of backstabbing and skullduggery going on between the, the different groups. Um, the Russians are involved as well. And my central character has to find a way to deal with the Russians, which he doesn't like doing, uh, but he, he doesn't really have much choice but to find a way to deal with the Russians. So, you know, I, I want to make it interesting for the reader. I want to I want the reader to enjoy the skullduggery, that element of it, um, and to sort of be amused by the different politicians stabbing each other in the back, making alliances. Uh, horse trading between them um, and things like that. The other thing I, I would say I was very keen to do was each book of the trilogy is written so it can be read by itself. So you can just read book one and that's a story. You can read book two and you you know where you are. You know, you don't need to read book one in order to read book two. And then I did the same again, book three. You can read book three without reading the other two. Um, I give you the information you need, but not as a big info dump, um, but sort of I feed it in piecemeal to the story so that you, you get the backstory that you need to know. That's awesome, Mr. Paul. They are not interdependent each other. So what role does research play in enhancing the authenticity of your trilogy? Uh, it plays a massive role. It plays a massive role. I spent years reading about what happened in Yugoslavia. Um, I've got a, a bookshelf probably with about 20 books that I read in order to do this. Um, these days you can do it much quicker. You can go on Wikipedia and Google and get more ideas from there as well. But I, I got a lot of it from books, from journalists, from historians, um, to try and get a feel for the kind of thing that would happen and then to feed in events not quite the same as, but parallel to things that happen in my book. Mm. Yes, indeed. So how did you make uh, uh, write effectively, manage the pacing of your trilogy? I spent a, a lot of time worrying about the pacing and working on the pacing. 
I used to draw diagrams on paper um, of excitement level. So I'd, I'd have chapter one, the excitement level goes, ah, and then I have chapter two, the excitement level goes, ah, and it's it's got to be up and down, up and down. You know, you, you get an up at the end of the chapter, then the next chapter has to go down and go up. And I, I looked at the chapters and looked at the excitement level of each chapter and then looked at the peaks. So I, I would say in the book that there are probably about three big peaks in the book where um, things happen and lives are in danger and the chance of failure is at its greatest. So there's a number of peaks in the book and there's a few twists. There's one guy who's who's a good guy, you like him, and then, whoa, what's he doing? Is this a good guy or a bad guy? So I, I put one of those in as well to surprise the reader, to make the reader think, oh, I didn't see that coming. What's going on there? So, you know, peaks, troughs, and surprises. That That's a key factor that you've got to put in. Surprises, people. Surprises. So in what ways your dialogue to be used to reveal character and advance the plot? I, dialogue is key. Uh, my books have a lot of dialogue. And I spend a long time on the dialogue. I always read the dialogue out loud. And sometimes when you read a bit of dialogue out loud, you think, oh, that needs to change. So you go back and change a little bit of the dialogue. Um, there's a key scene where there's conflict between the central character and his wife, that they have a conversation where she expresses her resentment at the danger that he has placed her in. Um, and I think it's a very beautiful conversation they have. It's not a row. Uh, she's just expressing her feelings and he's responding to what she's saying. And it's all done in dialogue. You know, the the thing they say you have to do in writing a novel is show, don't tell. You don't say, she was very angry about what he did. You have a conversation in which she expresses her anger about what he's done that's placed her in danger. Um, so yeah, dialogue is key. And it's through dialogue that a lot of people learn. Uh, the reader will learn about something that doesn't quite appear in the narrative, but then it comes in a dialogue. Uh, yes. Very much. And conflict between the people, again, very much comes in dialogue. Yes, people do show and don't tell. And that's the secret. Th th there's one other thing that's happening. Um, you see in dialogue, you know, that somebody's saying this to someone, but you know that they're doing something completely different. You know that they're lying, mm. but the other person in the conversation doesn't know they're lying. There, there's quite a bit of that that I, I stick into. Interesting, Mr. Strategies that help you to overcoming writer's block during uh, the writing process of your yeah, trilogy. I, I don't get writer's block. I don't get it. Um, I think the strategy I, I use to overcome it, I, I mean, I don't get writer's block. The strategy I use to not get writer's block is planning. If you've planned your story, then you know what you've got to write. Yeah, you know, I don't sit there with a blank page, not knowing what I'm going to write. I sit there with a plan, knowing what I'm going to write. The plan is not set in stone. So if I'm writing and then I have an idea, I'll go with that idea and I'll see with that idea where it takes me. Um, the big thing in the second book of the trilogy is I had my plan and I was writing away and I thought, what if I kill this important character? I wonder what would happen if I kill this person? And so I killed them. And that took the whole story in a different direction. And I was very pleased with that. I mean, I'm sorry to kill this character. I like this character. But the the character's death became a very important part of the story. And the character's death echoes still in the third book of the trilogy. 
interesting mr paul but before we go on i'm inviting you to listen to my other podcast food 101 our fourth season with chef alessandro one of the best executive chef in one of the five star hotel in downtown toronto so please do listen to our latest episode we talk about our food 101 culinary course that we are all offering so please do Listen and purchase our Food 101 Volume 1 Basics, one of our culinary courses that we are offering. So, Mr. Paul, what are the key considerations in revising and editing the draft to improve clarity and coherence in your trilogy? Yeah, a lot of writers um, say they don't like editing. They enjoy writing and hate editing. I love editing. I love looking at my text and going through it. First of all, looking for errors, looking for mistakes. And secondly, thinking, how can I make it better? The key thing you have to do is to cut. Yeah, your first draft is going to be really long and you need to bring it down. And then you have a new idea and it gets a bit longer and then you've got to bring it down again. Um, so... I, I edit as I write. Some people will write the first draft without editing at all. I don't. I edit it as I write. Um, and then I enjoy the process of editing it and cutting it down, bringing it down. The next stage after I've got it, I think I've got it ready, is I send the book out to beta readers. Beta readers are people who will agree to read the book free and then they will criticize the book. And for Day of the Long Knives, I had some really good beta readers who had practical suggestions about how I could improve it. So the next stage is to send it out to your beta readers, get their feedback and work on it and improve it. And then your next stage is to send it to an editor and get their feedback and improve it. And then the final stage is to send it to someone to get it proofread. Um, and then you get it back and it's very, very difficult with word processors not to tinker with it. You know, every time I go through it, I think, oh, I'd like to change this a little bit. Oh, I'd like to change that a little bit. Um, and occasionally you'll get a reader who will contact you and say, there's a spelling mistake or a typo or you forgot to put the full stop here. So you have to go back in and go into Amazon KDP and correct your typo put your full stop or whatever. So to a certain extent, it never ends. It, it goes on forever. And it, it's a process I enjoy very much. In fact, for me, rather than editing being a pain, it's difficult to let it go. You know, when you finish a book, especially when you finish a trilogy, you spend a lot of time in the company of these people and you become very fond of them. And when you finally finish your trilogy, you have to say goodbye to them. And that's a bit tough in a way, because you become very fond of these people. Definitely. So, Mr. Paul, what will be your advice for the aspiring authors out there, or writers, that they want to embark this journey? Okay, first thing, don't expect to make any money. Okay, we're not all JK Rowling. Uh, you might make money, you never know. Second thing is learn your craft. Do a writing course. Uh, get books on writing. Get books that teach you how to structure your novel, how to plan your novel, how to think about genre, what genre you're writing in to identify your genre. And stick, to a certain extent, you don't have to stick 100% to the conventions of your genre. Second thing is get other people to read what you write and Listen to the criticism. The criticism might hurt. You know, you want people to come back and say, oh, that's wonderful. You're, you're the latest, you know, Stephen King or whoever. Um, but the best people to read it are the people who don't say that. They're the people who say, well, I like this bit, but you need to change that bit. And you need to listen to them. You don't have to do everything they say. Um, but, you know, constructive criticism is vital listen to constructive criticism and use it to grow as a writer for sure very well said mr paul and what is your short-term and long-term goals in writing 
Okay, my my goal at the moment um, is to sell more books. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Um, it's to give people something very interesting to read, to give them characters who they can care about and enjoy reading about. Um, all of my books are also there. I try to do something a little bit deeper than just the surface of the novel. So my trilogy is about ethnic conflict and political conflict. And I guess there's a plea for tolerance in there, tolerance of dis between different ethnic groups and a plea for democracy. Definitely people let's support Mr. Paul Clark because if you support him more, more, more books to come. So Mr. Paul, thank you for your time. More to come people, see you soon.